This interview was brought to you by the Omega Center. The Omega Center is an online forum striving to facilitate a deepening of consciousness, conversation, and connection as we seek God in our scientific age. The website is dedicated to education, formation, and inspiration in the converging fields of science and theology, and exists to support the work of author and theologian Ilya Delio. I'm sitting with Amy Edelstein, who is an educator, an author, and a public speaker on the topic of how mindfulness impacts transformation of self and society in education. In 2014, Amy founded the Inner Strength Foundation, a nonprofit organization that supports over 2,000 inner city teens with mindfulness and cultural development. Based on her 35 years of experience with contemplative practice and developmental philosophy, Amy designed the Inner Strength Foundation program to uniquely incorporate mindfulness stress reduction with adolescent neuroscience and cultural development so students can learn tools to see their experience in a broader context. Currently the subject of a research study by Syracuse University whose pilot has already showed really significant positive results. The Inner Strength Team program is committed to a long-term transformation and evidence-based results. Amy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. It's a real pleasure to be here. I thought for us to begin, um, just to ground our listeners in, in a little bit more about your work, if you could explain uh, how this intersection of mindfulness and public education started for you and what is unique about this approach? I decided to bring these tools into public education because I've had the privilege of spending at this point over 35 years immersed in my own exploration of different contemplative practices, many long retreats, and a lot of dialogue and discussion about the philosophical underpinnings of different practices, what they do, what their goals are. And what's motivated me from the time I was quite young was to envision ways that our world can work better. So I've always been interested in the structures of culture. And our structures of culture aren't just um, practical scaffolding that build our cities and our education systems, but they're also the philosophical underpinnings. And when we understand the worldview that we're using and we design according to the higher potentials that we can intuit and see, then we have a better chance of creating more creative, harmonious, and you know, deeply uh, purposeful ways of living together. I moved to Philadelphia in 2013 after living in an intentional community for almost three decades, mm. spending most of my time absorbed in philosophical contemplation and writing and reading. And I wanted to do something that would impact the culture of the city. This city is one of the 10 largest cities in America, and it's the poorest of the top 10. So the issues that you're dealing with here are you know, deeply intractable. I'm not going to solve um, you know, some of the urban blight or poverty, wealth disparity, lack of jobs, crime, et cetera, et cetera. But I felt that I could impact the way that students think, mm. the way that they engage with the complexity in front of them, the way that they can see their own experience in a broad swath of time. So can they look back and see the influence of 300 million years of brain development on their experience right now? Can they look at the last 800 years of cultural development and the shift uh, and complexification of our lives, the shift from modernity to post-modernity, greater freedoms, more opportunity, more option, less social support, less direction, mm. less depth. Mm. So I thought if I can empower as many kids as possible in high school when they're really thinking about what am I going to do when I grow up, what, what's my contribution going to be, how can I think differently, if I can empower them to engage, then their creative potential is going to be liberated to address a lot of the structures and culture that need change. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, what we're talking about is a complete shift in perspective. It seems like your work is 
um, concerned with allowing students to transcend their 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 very kind of myopic perspective that tends to be how we culturally look at ourselves and our world from my my own little corner of the universe, my own little experiences, and to have a much more evolutionary view of themselves, of society, which that kind of elevated perspective is very empowering because then you can begin to see how you can participate in changing things and exploring new possibilities and new creative uh, uh, it, it unleashing new creative potential. So exactly. Yeah. 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 What's your, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, so how, how does mindfulness in particular play and how, how does it, um, if you could explain for us a little bit, what is, what is a contemplative pedagogy and how do you bring that into the school system? What has your experience been with that? Mm. They're good questions. And when I use the term mindfulness, I use it in, in broad strokes. Um, I have done classical mindfulness, insight, meditation, training, um, both in the Theravada tradition and the types of mindfulness that are done in the Mahayana tradition as well as in um, some Vedantic practices also cultivate that kind of focus and awareness and attention. Um, I use the term more loosely, so I'm not specifically teaching um, a labeling focus or but I am working with breath awareness presence the ability to separate oneself from one's identification with thought mm. so this is a powerful thing for any age group but when you can take 17 year olds and show them that there's a difference between mind or brain, the organ of perception, thought and feeling, the objects of perception, and awareness, that backdrop that seems to be aware of the two, they can really begin to get some space from the things that really upset them. Mm -hmm. And when they can get some space from the things that upset them, they're better able to self-regulate. They don't lash out in anger. They don't take to self-harm. They are able to focus on their academics. And they're able to move through challenging times of grief, loss, disappointment, um, and trauma. Mm. The trauma mindfulness work that I do is, is a little bit more body-based. So we do body scans. We do breath awareness that... Um, gets the students in touch with their physicality because that tends to help them um, be able to handle extreme anxiety. And a lot of the students that I teach are in honors programs. So they're you know, taking advanced placement classes and very rigorous classes, but 82% come from families of poverty. Mm. So 82% of these kids are at the poverty line or below, which means they're living in neighborhoods where there's um, drug addiction, gun violence, and, you know, just a very rough environment. So they've seen a lot, mm. and it's very hard for them to settle down. So I use the mindfulness tools to help them relax, get calm, uh, be able to deal with anxiety by using tactile forms of mm -hmm. mindfulness practice. But I also like to push them to really explore who they are, what awareness is, what thought is, mm -hmm. and all those more complex questions about the nature of mind. And I let them know that as, as advanced as neuroscience is these days in mapping the parts of our brain that can measure, that, that, can, that are responsible for different emotions, the hard question in neuroscience is why are we conscious at all? Mm -hmm. And when did consciousness arise from? So I'd like to bring these things into the classroom and talk about some of the um, leading ed edge research that's presented at conferences like the Science of Consciousness at University of Arizona with David Chalmers' work and mm -hmm. other people like that because it just messes with their mind in a very <laughs> positive way. And it gets them to think about questions that there aren't answers to rather than questions that they can't answer. So mm -hmm. it's very empowering and liberating mm -hmm. of their creativity. 
So that's how I use mindfulness in the classroom. Um, I do have a 12 week structured curriculum, mm -hmm. which is the inner strength system. I have, I train teachers. So I have a lesson plan and a manual though. So it's it there, there is a rigorous structure to this program. So it fits in academic um, classes. Mm -hmm. I try to get the schools to take 12 periods once a week out of it, you know, an English seminar, a biology seminar, a psychology, or, and so I, I make sure that there's enough rigorous academic and intellectual work as well as the tools. Hmm. Now, what, what bringing a contemplative pedagogy into the classroom does is it changes the dynamic and the power relationship between the instructor and the student. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because what we're looking for is the authenticity of engagement rather than a specific outcome. So I let the kids know they don't have to like meditating. They don't even have to meditate, but they have to participate in the discussions. And when they write essays at the end, I always invite them to let me know if they really didn't find any value in it, that that's okay. But they have to be thoughtful about why not. Mm. So that contemplation is creating space within letting them get in touch with their own sense of the numinous without ever introducing any spiritual concepts in class. Yeah. It's not an Eastern or Western mysticism class in disguise. It's focused much more in history, evolutionary theory an understanding of worldviews and paradigms, what our current paradigm is, um, evolutionary biology in terms mm -hmm. of brain science, and then practices that help self-regulate. Mm -hmm. So it feels very secular, and yet through the embodiment of the, the unknown by the teachers themselves, the instructors who go in, the kids are free to start exploring in ways they wouldn't normally. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's so amazing. And I'm, as I'm sitting here talking to you, you know, our, our audience can't see this, but you have these mm. beautiful glasses on and I'm thinking, you know, this is really similar to what you're describing is we, we walk through life with a certain lens prescription on, and especially in education, we don't realize that we're looking at education and what we're learning through a specific lens prescription. And it sounds to me like part of what you're empowering young students to do is to take off those glasses and, first of all, even realize that they're on, the, on their face to begin with. But then secondly, to observe and look at them and say, okay, how did this form? What is my lens prescription? Where did this come from? And how does this impact me? And is it, might it be time for uh, a system update of a new prescription? or how are these lenses constantly changing and who is the I, the witnessing self who's observing all these things. Um, I wonder if you could share with us, you know, just this strikes me as rather revolutionary because we, we approach education in such a mental way, factual, uh, empirical data, information, um, and this kind of approach brings in the whole body and it's a, it's a philosophical exploration as well as kind of a, a phenomenology uh, unpacking of how we learn and what's going on in our brains. And um, I wonder if you would share about that, that frictional point. I mean, do you encounter a lot of people in education who are like, what are you doing and what's wrong with our system and we don't need any help? Thank you very much. Um, oh, lots of questions. <laughs> the lens, I want to start with what you picked up about the lens and being able to show students that they're seeing through a particular lens and their experience isn't just, it's not their fault. You know, it's not just that they were born in a particular zip code or that they don't have the IQ or that they're deficient in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And while inner city kids do need a tremendous amount of support, I feel strongly that we, we want to approach them and extend that support in terms of liberating their higher capacities, not fixing what's wrong or healing what's broken. 
I just don't think um, anyone likes to feel empowered by identifying as a victim, mm -hmm. even if they are a victim of racial discrimination, the wealth divide, systemic poverty, um, things that happen that's, uh, that are out of con their control. If you can liberate their potential while acknowledging and giving them space to self-heal and to move beyond in a safe and supportive space, then you're really accessing and activating and getting them to trust that life force, that um, part of the human nature that we can't really identify, mm -hmm. but seems to move in these mysterious ways that are life positive. Uh, so by showing them an the evolutionary perspective, showing them that this fight, flight, or freeze, when you know a teacher tells them that they have a pop quiz and it's 60% of their grade and it's exactly what they didn't study and it's totally unfair and they either want to shout <laughs> or run out of the room or just they freeze, it's their evolutionary brain reacting. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. It's not because they're out of their control. But as they understand that, there's less self-criticism. And as there's less self-criticism, then they can take a few breaths, wait till that adrenaline dies down, and then proceed. And, and they really, when they get that, they feel so free mm -hmm. and empowered even though it doesn't change, it may not change that, that experience at the time. They may still react. Uh, so it's not about just behavior modifica modification and control. And so I think that's a very important part of shifting worldviews. I also challenge them with the task that really is going to fall on their generation and the generation after them, which is to begin to create new social structures that are more supportive. So we've expanded and evolved culturally so that we have so much choice, so many options, so much freedom. They can get on the phone and meet somebody through Facebook who lives in Gambia and see that person on their phone, in their hand, in their classroom um, instantly mm -hmm. and talk to them. I mean, that was Star Trek episodes, the old <laughs> ones. <laughs> <laughs> when I grew up. Mm. So the, the possibilities are enormous, but so is the sense of alienation. And mm -hmm. you talked about how in some ways we're getting, we're getting siloed. Mm -hmm. I remember the time when there was a, the internet was new and there were these big discussions about whether they should start introducing algorithms to help you, you know, to bias your searches to help you get what you want. Right. And that was a big discussion because who was going to decide? And then, of course, the internet grew so fast that it became unwieldy, so you had to do that. Mm -hmm. But then you realize that we're, for positive reasons, getting fed certain things that are narrowing our world. Now, if I want Vietnamese food near me, I definitely want to type Vietnamese restaurant near me so I don't get a Vietnamese restaurant in Vietnam. It's not really going to help me <laughs> right. for takeout. <laughs> of course, it's useful, but it has limited us in certain ways. So we are starting to see through a worldview that's not really our own construction. Mm. And, and that's a very new thing because we always saw through a worldview that was culturally influenced. It was based in religion. It was based in geography, where we lived, the cultural climate, the environment around us, the natural environment around us. You know, if you think about, you know, indigenous peoples in Australia, they, of course, you know, spoke and indigenous peoples and in other cultures, they spoke about the environment as a real thing that influenced their worldview, which of course it is. Yeah. Now our worldview is more and more being influenced by algorithms. Hmm. It's fascinating. What does that mean? How do we create 
real human aspirational connectivity that is allows us to connect in terms of the essence of our humanity but across boundaries so how can we be in this this hyper global world that we're in not lose that not not become small and parochial while fostering the kind of depth of human support, respect, uh, spirit mm. that you could think would be more easy in more simple environments. So these are the challenges that I tell the kids that are up to them and their generation, the next generation to start figuring out. Wow. Yeah, I, it seems like we're talking about um, the relationship between limits and potentiality. And as you're describing these algorithms, and I'm thinking about teenagers in particular, uh, how much of our impulses, especially at that age, are around identification. And the relationship between identification is no longer a private ordeal. I am no longer just talking about Am I a girl who sits at this table? Am I hanging out with this social group of people in my high school? Because I'm online, that identification is now impacting these algorithms that you're describing. And so it's impacting what is being brought to me from the out, external, uh, outside world, as well as what limitations are being placed on my potential and in very, very subtle ways through mm -hmm. messaging and um, commercialism and uh, the impact of, of the advertisement world and so yeah I think identification is a really tricky subtle thing and it's curious to me that we don't spend more time um, exploring that and discussing the impact that it has and from a neuroscience perspective what is happening in the brain of a teenager um, that drew you in particular to that age group but also that kind of pinpoints like the immense potential of that age and, and how creating these patterns at that time can have such a long range of impact into the future. Oh, that's a great question. Um, there were a few questions in there, but maybe I'll start at the end because that's the one I remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the most. Um, well, what, draws me to this age, I, I, there are a couple of things. There's, I started my own meditation exploration when I was a sophomore in a 2000 student high school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I didn't fit in. And it was the 70s, so we were still inspired by the 60s idealism, and it was post-Watergate. So I was very cynical about what was possible. Um, so it was an interesting time. And I found a book. And so I started with a book. And it really picked up on thing, experiences that I'd had when I was really quite young. When I was four, my father, who was a physicist, particle physicist, used to explain subatomic particles to us. So I used to sit there and look at my hand and press my hand on the dining room table, which I remember very vividly, and try to figure out if I pushed really hard where my fingers ended and the table began. Wow. You know, because if it's all space and the electrons are swirling around in my fingers and they're swirling around in the table and it's the same electron substance, <laughs> what's the difference? Right. Where do I end and where does something else begin? So this was something that he kind of planted in me at a very young age. And then when I was in grade school, in early grade school, I had the opportunity to live in Israel for a year. My father was working on an experiment there with other physicists. And I went to school as a third grader. And I had a real connection with the land and with the history mm -hmm. in a way that my secular upbringing hadn't prepared me for at all. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were seeds of questions that were there from a very young age, which most people have. And then when I was in high school and frustrated, um, I just found books 
and I read Be Here Now, and I read Autobiography of a Yogi, and I read Richard Hittleman's 28 Day Guide to Yoga, and and that's just gave me enough to start looking. So when I thought about working with this age, what's nice about 16, 17 year olds, you know, 11th grade, 12th grade is they can self reflect. They're developed enough mm. so that they're able to objectify their own sense of self. When I work with younger kids, which I, I really don't, I try not to work in middle school um, just because it's a different program. My program demands a lot of them and you have to be a little bit more developed to do it. But I can see that ninth graders have a really hard time objectifying their thoughts and feelings. Hmm. They can't really step outside themselves and see themselves. Yeah. Whereas once you're 15, 16, 17, you can. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like that age. And from a neuroscience point of view, there's a specific thing happening in the brain during the period of adolescent brain growth, which they define as between the ages of 15 and 22 or the outside 12 and 30. They're not. And during this period of brain growth, one of the things the brain does is uh, an, an activity called pruning. Basically, we have billions of neural pathways that have developed since we were in utero. And during the period of adolescent brain growth, the brain literally goes and gives itself a haircut. So it snips away the extra pathways and it preferences those pathways that are most strong. Wow. So that's powerful. So the habit, habits formed during adolescence are, you know, they're, they're not totally predictive because the brain does change. There is, they have discovered neuroplasticity. So, but it's very hard to repattern the brain. Hmm. Teenage addictions are much more dangerous than adult addictions because of what's happening in the brain at that point with wow. this brain pruning and biasing. So getting the kids to start practicing being still and letting go of thought and paying attention to what's happening in their body mm. and using their awareness to work with the breath and work with their physicality and learn how to self-regulate and de-stress and dial back is it's really beneficial at this age because mm. they, they have the capacity to understand why they're doing it. So it's not just a game like it is in grade school. And it's the time when the brain is making important decisions. Right. So it's, all, it's even more important to, to have kids learn age-appropriate mindfulness practices. You know, generally, they shouldn't go and sit for many, many hours at a time. Right. You know, small doses helps build good habit. They don't need very intensive work, and it can be detrimental. Right. Uh, for your audience, and I always tell the teachers this, mindfulness isn't a, you know, the magic pill that's going to take everything away. And kids can have adverse reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that anyone introducing contemplative practice in a school understands and, and is respectful of the power of Mindful, mindfulness practice that when you are still um, different things can come to the forefront that the kids aren't prepared for. Yeah. It can trigger anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's been some kind of sexual abuse in early childhood that they have don't remember, there can be disassociation. So the person bringing this into the classroom has, a, you know, carries a tremendous responsibility yeah. to be very familiar with the tools, understand the discomfort, be watchful and sensitive for signs of discomfort in the students that need to be responded to, that they just need to be gently brought out of the breathing. And I, unfortunately, I have seen several kids um, experience panic after a minute in a very distracted classroom. So I'm not talking about 20 minutes of practice. And yeah. I like to bring that in because 
these tools are new and they're great and I love them and I think it's really valuable, but I want to encourage anyone listening to just be very aware mm -hmm. and very sensitive because we never know who's in front of us. We never know what's happened to them. We never know how they're going to respond. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we're leading with empathy and sensitivity and not with fixed ideas about how great <laughs> these tools are. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, it seems like that's a byproduct of our understanding of both education, but also spirituality as being a, a form of transcending the body or escaping the material realm. And it seems like a lot of what I'm, I'm discovering around contemplative pedagogy is the importance of context and embodiment. And we cannot bypass trauma. And I feel that so much of spirituality is, is sort of awakening to that recognition mm -hmm. to, to the very, very subtle ways in which some of these spiritual practices have become disembodied and are sort of promoting a bit of spiritual bypassing past the physical needs of the human body, past the, the stored traumatic memory that can often be present in the body. And um, so, yeah, I'm very grateful that you brought that up. Is there a resource? I mean, I know you do this training, but I wonder for our listeners if you have a resource that you recommend to people who are interested, maybe educators who might be interested in exploring this further that you would recommend. Um, the work of Peter Levine is really beautiful, and he's, he's probably the most popular and experienced, and he has some very good tools. Uh, a book called The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk is also a really great resource. If, um, you know, Bessel has a, you know, really a wealth and depth of clinical experience, and he's really gone quite deeply into this. So um, you know, those two resources would be good places to start. Um, mm -hmm. Kenneth Ginsberg is at University of Pennsylvania. He's also the head of the National... I think it's the national health work for the Covenant House. And the Covenant House works with uh, homeless youth. And okay. so he's, he's also an MD and has done a tremendous amount of work. And those, those three are the resources that I've felt are, you know, anyone can get something out of all of their work, whether you're an educator or not, and whether you understand these tools or right. not, whether you're a parent who just wants to parent better and, you know, with all this talk about trauma and anxiety, parents yeah. are worried about instilling their kids with trauma <laughs> and anxiety. So um, <laughs> Kenneth Ginsberg's work is really good with that. He has a nice mm. book for parents on, you know, the, of course, the best thing for kids is knowing that they're, the adults in their lives love them mm -hmm. and are there for them. Mm. and are rooting for them mm. and then mistakes are made by all of us in all our relationships and yeah. it's not the end of the world so a fearful parent um is is not not that helpful whereas a parent who can extend that love and trust yeah. of themselves as yeah. well yeah oh that's beautiful amy we've been sort of dancing around uh talking about uh, evolution and how the perspective of evolution could be so helpful in developing that awareness that you speak of and i wonder if before we we close our wonderful conversation if you could just touch briefly on your work with tayard your encounter of his of his work and how it's animating your current exploration of of teaching young people mindfulness i love the work of teilhard de chardin and i love the fact that he was really a man of his time he's like an incredible mystic but what i like is his his one of his most often quoted lines which i'm gonna butcher but it's about the second discovery of fire yeah um so it's about love and how love is the second discovery of fire. But that those four lines come at the end of an essay that he wrote about the need for the church to change its views on celibacy. Yeah, the chastity. <laughs> and I love that because yeah. he was basically just dealing with 
the mores of the times of the 50s or whenever he wrote that essay, I think it was later in his life. And you know, he felt that it was so important for us to be in human relationships and that, I mean, it was partly his times, but, you know, for, I don't think we'd say it exactly in that way now, but he said, you know, men need to learn to love and they need to be in relationship with women in order to develop that capacity to love, not to, in order simply to love another, but in order to be able to love God or the mm -hmm. numinous. Mm -hmm. And um, which I think, you know, he just showed so much engagement with the structures of culture of his time. And then, of course, his his sense of the profound interconnectivity of all things, mm. that he, you know, you know, what an unusual being, as, as I'm sure your listeners know, when he was a medic in the front lines of World War I, he was going back and forth with, the, you know, this just horrific suffering. It was such a brutal war. And during that, he started to really... Um, articulate his first understandings of the interconnectedness of all things and how we live in a world that is constantly moving and changing. Mm. And his life's work was about how do you understand this continuous unfolding of potential and capacity and creative union with the already always present, whole, perfect, not lacking divinity or the divine milieu that we're in the midst of. And that profound and beautiful tension of the, the grace that we experience when we really tap into that sense of perfection and wholeness and cosmic beauty mm that has nothing to do with the blemishes and suffering and fracture, fracturedness that we see in the world around us, that we can know that very deeply and also see the, the division that needs healing, even though at one level there is no division. Mm -hmm. And we can also see that there are not just healing division, but there are new potentials and new aspects of connectivity that are being brought into the world that didn't exist before, as we're also losing things that yes. because of our complexity that did exist before. So mm -hmm. what, what I love about Teilhard is just his immersion in all these ideas. And in my own understanding of evolution is what I love is just the influence and interrelatedness of all things where you really see that we can't disembed ourselves mm -hmm. from seven, you know, 13.7 billion years of history. Mm -hmm. We can't disembed ourselves from that. And yet also there's a part of us or dimensions of us that also seem to be outside of time. Mm -hmm. And we can't really understand that, but we can intuit it. And also that evolution doesn't just mean a linear timeline that starts at zero and goes to infinity. Hmm. If it's infinite, if the nature of consciousness or God is infinite and has no beginning and no end, then it has no beginning and no end in all directions. Hmm. the beginning and the end and the up and the down. And as the Tibetans, Buddhists like to say, all 10 directions. Yeah. And, and I really feel that to, to truly inhabit the profundity of the evolutionary worldview that Teilhard was pointing to, our view of evolution needs to be multidimensional, hmm. multidirectional, hmm. and it needs to rest in the non-dual nature of form and emptiness mm -hmm. and not just bias form and the unfolding of things as divorced from emptiness and wholeness and utter non-separation of everything. Mm. Wow. Um, I feel so immersed in Teilhard's perspective, but also I'm so grateful for the ways that you're um, expressing 
his viewpoint, but from our standpoint, where we stand today, knowing what we know about science and where, where our, our, our current context sits, uh, recognizing so some of the pieces that you're naming, that the non-linearity of things and that we know that time isn't as linear. And so therefore our understandings of how we intersect and interact with each other, um, it's not just in our context, but it's also in, in dimensional qualities that we can't even fully comprehend and so much more uh, three-dimensional than a linear understanding of time. And I know our listeners are probably hearing this and they're like, wait, okay, yep, my brain exploded about like five minutes ago and I really have no idea what we're talking about. But I think that uh, one of the ways that we can simplify is this understanding that ultimate potentiality is available to all of us here and now. That it's not a future development that we will be able to reach at some point in the future, but rather is fully available to us now. And so some of these tools of mindfulness that you're equipping young students with are things that we spend a lot of time talking about um, on the Omega Center as practices that we can engage in now. How are we orienting our lives to that fullness of potentiality here and now, that full creative, that, that rediscovery of fire <laughs> that we can harness together um, for, for outcomes that we can't even yet imagine. Um, so how are we orienting our lives to that reality and to that presence now? Um, and how are we learning to shed some of those identifications that keep us limited or uh, sort of pressure us into uh, a, a separate understanding of reality, separate from ourselves, separate from each other, separate from time. So um, as we wrap up this conversation, Amy, I wonder if you would share, you've talked a lot about your background in mindfulness and I always like to ask everybody, what is one practice that you do that- I just lost you for a second. Oh, okay. Okay, you're <laughs> no problem. Um, you were just asking me to share something. Yeah. I always like to finish our conversations by um, asking uh, you to share what is one practice that you can offer our audience? Uh, what's one thing that maybe you do or maybe something you teach that you can offer our audience that could be a practice that we can take with us today um, to touch into some of these very complex uh, understandings of time and space and reality and potential and neuroscience uh, yeah that we could kind of ground ourselves in and and work with this week mm. I'll give you I'll I'll take us through a few minutes of a very simple open awareness exercise that you can practice at all levels of subtlety or not and I teach this in the classroom and the kids like it but it really is a more visual form of the way that um, I often sit mm. and just feel into that mystery that's behind thought and time so I'll guide us through um, if everyone can be comfortable, please don't do this while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> so please sit in a comfortable posture with your spine tall to help oxygenate your brain and keep the mind clear. And now imagine that it's summertime and beautiful and it's evening and you're in a safe and beautiful place. When you have a picture of that, you're walking outside, let yourself lie down on the grass and look up at the night sky above you. And at first, you'll start noticing the brightest stars, the planets. Some are a little bit blue, some are a little bit red. The light that we're seeing now is millions of years old. 
it's taken so long to reach us. You may see a shooting star or even the movement of lights of an airplane or a satellite. And as you lie in the grass being held by the earth, the more you look, the more little pinpricks of light appear. And now take your attention and shift it just off of all the little dots of light and begin to pay attention to the night sky, to that dark black space that extends in all directions. As you're looking at the night sky, see if you can follow it as far as it goes. And each time your attention moves back to the stars or your thoughts, just move it, shift it ever so subtly, and just pay attention to the space, the infinite space that's unbothered by anything that arises within it. There's room to contain everything. Be aware of the qualities of expansiveness that arise. And know that you're still being held by the earth beneath you as you let your attention go, exploring that which extends infinitely in all directions. And now we can bring our attention back and finish the exercise. Mm, Thank you so much, Amy. This has been such a rich dialogue. So grateful for you and your incredible work. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.